Lighthouses, perhaps more than any other type of structure, seem to inspire Americans and fill us with a sense of pride and wonder. In many ways, it seems these tall towers stand for the best our country has to offer. Well, one thing is that lighthouses are usually quite beautiful. They're also a symbol of stability and security and uh, a haven in a storm. I think they make people feel really, it's part of American heritage, these wonderful lighthouses that we have. To me, it's, it's, it's about the fact that they serve to protect. And uh, it's, it's altruism in its purest form. Uh, that's all they do. To see a sentinel on the coast um, gives you a sense of permanence. It gives you a sense of strength. And when things are uncertain in the world, when things are, people feel like they're in danger or they feel like they are um, not as secure as they would like to be, lighthouses symbolize a strong arm, uh, protection, and all of those things. And, and it speaks to that part of our soul um, that, that we are safe here and that, that things will last. The lighthouses of the Southeast are each unique. They range in height from 175 feet to just 25 feet tall. Some wear dazzling, colorful paint schemes, while others are more subtle or subdued. They range in shape from round to octagonal and even triangular. Together, they tell a fascinating story. Come with us now as we visit the lighthouses of the Southeast. If you plan to visit historic lighthouses in America, consider starting with the Ponce de Leon Inlet Light Station near Daytona Beach, Florida. Like many of the other historic lighthouses open to the public nationwide, you'll find a lovingly restored masonry tower. You can climb the 203 steps to the top of the 175-foot tall lighthouse and enjoy stunning views in every direction. There are also restored keepers' houses and other support structures that interpret life here for the keepers and their families since the tower was constructed in the 1880s. One of the things that uh, uh, we're very proud of is um, that folks who come here primarily for the climb uh, stay for the history. A scale model inside one of the structures explains a unique scaffold-like system the builders used to construct the lighthouse. Here's a photo of the real thing in use. Other exhibits deal with famous shipwrecks that happened just offshore. But the one thing that truly sets this museum apart from any other is its magnificent collection of Fresnel lenses, the 19th century French-designed contrivances of bullseye lenses and thousands of angled glass prisms that focused the light and allowed it to be seen miles out at sea. The entire collection is housed in a special structure on the light station's grounds. It is very, very impressive. Uh, the magic of these things is that they are artistic and beautiful, but people also have to understand that they were the first state of the art for the time. That what they did to lighthouse lighting was Make, make every available light ray usable. Fresnel captures that with the Fresnel lens and dramatically forces the light straight out where you want it to go instead of being lost by going up or down. That's the magic of the, uh, uh, of the Fresnel lens. What's more, some of the lights are in motion revealing the beautiful, finely detailed Victorian combinations of gears and metal pieces that controlled the movement and gave each light its own signature flash pattern. Before electricity, it worked uh, by a clockwork mechanism or weights on, uh, on chains, and it was a counterweight structure, uh, much like a grandfather's clock, where you would actually crank the lead weight up to the top and then it would gradually counterweight with itself, with its other weight, 
And uh, so the, the keeper had an additional job in addition to tending the light and trimming the wick and making sure that everything was, was ship shaped, so to speak, up top, but also had to crank the, um, the, the, the mechanism. The team here at Ponce de Leon Inlet has developed a well-earned reputation for restoring lenses, so much so that these folks are in demand for this type of work all around the world. The day of my visit, curator Ellen Henry was painstakingly completing the restorative work on a unique lens that was built by lighthouse keepers to help early airplane pilots find their way. The reason they went into the aviation beacon business is because nobody else knew beacons like the lighthouse service and these were needed to help guide uh, airplanes in the early airmail service. They didn't have the kinds of navigational instrumentation they do now. Well, they were flying with a compass and uh, an altimeter and that's about it. In case you're wondering, the ornate Fresnel lens that currently illuminates the top of the Ponce de Leon Inlet Tower came from the Sapelo Island, Georgia Lighthouse when it was decommissioned in the 20th century. Our characteristic, uh, established in 1933, is six flashes over 15 seconds, evenly spaced over 15 seconds, and then there is what is called a 15-second eclipse. That is a solid but muted white light and then the flashing repeats. So it's six flashes, 15 seconds, a 15 second eclipse, and then repeat of the flashes. During the day, the paint scheme on lighthouse towers served a similar identifying function. Now that we have the basics down pat, let's travel up the southeast Atlantic coast and learn more about the historic lighthouses that give this beautiful area so much of its grace and charm. The strikingly beautiful lighthouse in St. Augustine, Florida was built to be a showpiece, and it still is today. The first thing visitors notice is the fancy, swirling, black and white striped, red-topped paint job that graces the tower. That's called the day mark, and each day mark was assigned to each station by the U.S. Lighthouse Service so that you could tell them apart. It is called a black and white barber pole stripe with a red lantern. And the lantern is actually the entire top of the lighthouse that sits on top of the tower. The fancy stripes and colorful lantern aren't the only things that set this lighthouse apart. The other differences have to do with the architect who designed the structure and the man who put modern St. Augustine on the map, wealthy industrialist Henry Flagler. And it's interesting that this lighthouse was built, designed uh, by Paul Pels, who actually designed the U.S. Library of Congress, considered to be the most beautiful building in Washington. And he designed it in the 1800s for ladies with those big hoop skirts to climb because this was Flagler's town. And he knew that Flagler had a lot of influential friends that came here. So the spaces inside are much bigger. There are eight landings to stop and rest on. And that deck is huge compared to most lighthouses. And it was done for that purpose. Visitors enter the St. Augustine Lighthouse through a smaller masonry structure called the Oil House. Inside, you'll find the lighthouse keeper's office packed with the tools and objects required to keep the light on 365 days a year. You'll also get a sense of the massive quantities of heavy oil the keepers had to carry up the stairs every day to fuel the light. Adjacent to the tower stands the brick duplex which served as the keeper's quarters. Inside are exhibits about the lives of the keepers for whom this job was a good assignment. But this was pretty good duty as lighthouse keepers go because you could have been stationed five miles offshore in the northeast somewhere on a rock in the middle of the ocean. And in the basement stands a model of a former Spanish-built structure that preceded the current lighthouse. You can see the smaller fourth-order Fresnel lens that once lit the way into the harbor. One of the most unique things about the St. Augustine Lighthouse is an organization called LAMP, which stands for Lighthouse Archaeological Maritime Program. A small team of professional marine archaeologists, aided by a crew of university students and volunteers, regularly recovers artifacts from the many shipwrecks in St. Augustine's harbor, including what's believed to be a ship carrying British loyalists evacuating Charleston, South Carolina at the end of the American Revolution. <laughs> Today has just been a fabulous day and really kind of unprecedented, but today uh, it was unreal. We found a coin. Uh, we think we can see a profile of uh, King George. We, it looks like a British coin. 
Uh, we found a button uh, that has uh, the number 74 on it, so we believe that means it's a military button from the British uh, 74th Regiment. Uh, so today is just a fantastic. You don't have many days like this uh, in, in archaeology. We do a lot of our work outside where visitors can see it. You know, as soon as the archaeologists made the discoveries, they got to uh, participate as well. So that's a pretty, uh, pretty neat thing for an archaeologist. The combination of the lighthouse climb, the museum, and the active archaeology make the St. Augustine Lighthouse one of the best historic attractions of its kind in the nation. The Amelia Island Lighthouse, located in the city of Fernandina Beach, just south of the Georgia-Florida line, is Florida's oldest lighthouse. It was originally located across the border on Cumberland Island, Georgia, but was moved here and rebuilt brick by brick in 1838 to help better light the channel. Since the lighthouse, which is now operated by the city of Fernandina Beach, is located within a private neighborhood, you can only see it on special tours offered regularly by the city. These are usually led by Coast Guard Auxiliary member Helen Sentis, who has a deep personal connection to the lighthouse. Her father and grandfather were both longtime keepers here. Helen's father was also married to a descendant of the light's first keeper. And, and they took pride in it. You know, they were and they, my, my dad and my grandfather were both uh, award-winning keepers. You know, the old lighthouse service was very strict. And uh, you never knew when the, um, the inspector, the, you didn't, never knew just when he was going to be coming. So everything always had to look great. Helen herself grew up in the now-vanished keeper's cottage here and remembers visiting cousins whose parents were keepers in other lighthouses in the area. So I lived here for 20 years, my first 20 years of my life. And um, it's a wonderful place to grow up. Aside from Helen herself, another thing that makes the Amelia Island Lighthouse unique is the set of 69 New England granite stairs that wind their way to the lantern room. They were hand-hewn in New England and, and floated down on barges. But, um, and we're pretty sure that they were for this lighthouse. Though the city of Fernandina Beach owns the lighthouse and surrounding property, the Coast Guard is still responsible for the light, which is the original turn-of-the-century Fresnel lens that still guides mariners into the harbor. The St. Simons Island Lighthouse stands square in the middle of the most visited part of the island. It's the second lighthouse built on the spot where a harbor light has stood for two centuries. This is the entrance to the St. Simons Sound. And so this was a very important shipping channel for the ports of both Brunswick and also docks on St. Simons. The first light lighthouse was built in 1810 and it was octagonal in shape. 75 feet tall with a 10-foot lantern on top. The original lighthouse here was um, constructed with tabby that was actually partially taken from uh, Fort Frederica. Tabby is a mixture of sand and lime and, and shell that's, that's mixed together to make uh, cement. It also had brick at the very top of the lighthouse. The first St. Simon's Lighthouse is associated with one very resourceful man who built it and operated it for close to three decades. James Gould was a surveyor from Massachusetts and when he moved to Georgia and found out that, that a lighthouse was going to be built here, um, he was awarded the commission to, light the, to build a lighthouse and then uh, President Madison asked him to be the first keeper and he was keeper until 1837. Like many other southern lighthouses, the original St. Simon's Light met its end during the American Civil War. When the Confederate troops withdrew to Savannah, they actually demolished the lighthouse so that the Union Navy could not use it for navigation. Very little was left. Um, a photograph that we have from around 1870 shows only the foundation of the lighthouse. Soon after the Civil War, the federal government realized that, we, that a lighthouse was needed here at the St. Simon Sound. 
Charles Kleski was awarded the contract to build the St. Simons Lighthouse. There were specifications for the design of the lighthouse and those were followed very closely, which um, meant that we had to have a very sturdy building, which of course can withstand hurricane force winds. Very sturdy brick building with very thick walls. It was then completed in 1872. People of all ages love to climb the 129 steps of our lighthouse. One of the real attractions at the St. Simon's Light is the original Keeper's Cottage, a fancy Italianate brick dwelling with just as much character as the lighthouse itself. Inside, visitors find rooms revealing what life was like for the keepers and their families. Those families were very hard working. The, the job of a lighthouse keeper was every day, and of course every night he had to maintain the light, he and his assistants, and usually the whole family was involved. We were often cited in the local newspapers as having the, the neatest lighthouse, the, the cleanest lighthouse, the immaculately kept, kept lighthouse. Uh, that was a very important thing to the lighthouse keepers and to their families. Today, that tradition of excellence continues. We're very fortunate to have a third order Fresnel lens. It's the original lens to this tower, and we're fortunate to have it in working order today. Our lens is a local treasure, and we, we take very good care of it. Our Coast Guard Auxiliary maintains the lens for us, and they spend part of every week cleaning and maintaining our lens. It takes us four minutes to go around, so the code for this lighthouse is a quick flash every 60 seconds. It's some beautiful work in here. It's like velvet. I don't know how they did it. Sapelo Island is located about 60 miles southwest of Savannah in McIntosh County, Georgia. To reach the island and its historic lighthouse, you'll need to leave your car behind and enjoy a ferry ride that seems to take you back in time. The lighthouse here now is the, is the same structure that was completed in 1820. It was built in 1820 and it operated until the Civil War when it was abandoned and then the lighthouse was reactivated in 1868 for the use as a navigational aid for shipping coming into the port of Darien to load timber and lumber. The walls at the base are about two feet thick, maybe a little bit more than that, and it goes 80 feet. And it's uh, got a uh, iron rail or a gallery outside the lighthouse, which the light keeper would utilize for observation purposes. And, and it's uh, uh, pretty much the way the, the restoration was done was pretty much the way it originally was restored right down to the interior stairs and the, the, the fittings in the, in the lantern room, except for the Fresnel lens, which it no longer has. The day mark on Sapelo has always been what you see now. It's, it's the alternating red and white bands. When the lighthouse uh, was restored by the state of Georgia in uh, 1998, we repainted the lighthouse to have the historic day mark uh, to historically configure with the original day mark of the Sapelo light. The 1898 hurricane really did damage to the foundations of this lighthouse and the water is said to have risen about 17 to 18 feet up from the base of the lighthouse up the tower. Hurricane damage to the tower was so great that in 1905, authorities erected a new lighthouse on Sapelo, a 100 foot tall steel tower. This structure stood on the island until 1933 
when shipping in the area declined to the point that the government decided a lighthouse on Sapelo was no longer required. The tower was dismantled, moved, and reassembled on an island in Lake Michigan. Though the steel tower is gone, the stories of the families who tended both lights here on Sapelo remain. The most interesting family of lighthouse keepers were the Crumley family. There were three generations of the Crumley family who managed this light up until its deactivation in 1934. The lighthouse is very popular with the public. We do have the lighthouse open for interpretive tours that the state of Georgia conducts for the public. They ride the ferry boat over. And almost every tour, we have some lighthouse enthusiasts on our tour. And so we make it a point to stop here. They get to climb to the top and take photographs. And so it's very popular. Several years ago, we uh, were fortunate to get a grant and we can put up some interpretive signage. Also have a small exhibit room here in, in the old uh, kerosene storage building adjacent to the light. So all of these interpretive facilities have really enhanced the visibility of our lighthouse. And so now uh, we get people that come over here for the specific purpose uh, to, to see our lighthouse because it's relatively new being open to the public. For more than two and three quarter centuries, there has been a lighthouse on Tybee Island, Georgia, guiding vessels on their approach to the port of Savannah. The first tower was built in 1736. And that would have been an amazing engineering feat. It was built on cedar pilings that were driven down into the sand, and it was an octagonal structure built of brick, 90 feet tall and that would have made it the tallest lighthouse in America at the time. A storm swept away the first tower in 1741, but a new structure replaced it in 1742. It too was built too close to shore and was eventually claimed by the sea. The third Tybee Lighthouse was completed in 1773. It functioned until the top two-thirds were burned by Confederate troops during the Civil War. They realized a superior force were going to attack Tybee Island. So Robert E. Lee ordered all the outlying islands uh, vacated, but a detachment of the Jasper Green snuck back over on Tybee Island and burned the lighthouse so it wouldn't be used by federal forces. The lighthouse visitors see today dates from 1866-67, at least the top of it does. The top 94 feet were constructed during the post-Civil War period, but the bottom 60 feet or so actually dates to 1773. Today, in addition to the 144-foot tower, the Tybee Island Light Station boasts one of the most complete collections of lighthouse support buildings in the nation. There are cottages for three lighthouse keepers and their families. Yeah, most people don't realize the Tybee Light Station is one of the most complete light stations in America. We still have all of our historic support buildings that are associated with the operation of the light. Inside the lantern room atop the tower is a first order Fresnel lens, which casts a beam visible 18 miles out to sea. Since this lighthouse still functions as an important navigational aid for all the vessels entering Savannah, it is maintained by the local U.S. Coast Guard Aid to Navigation Team. Sailors from the unit regularly climb the 178 stairs to reach the lantern room and make sure the light is still in good working order. Uh, it's very important. It's actually part of a range uh, that uh, when the mariners come from uh, out in the ocean, when they come in, inbound into Savannah, they actually use this to steer on to get them into the correct channel. Bam. It's got a Coast Guard 2P, which is a two-position changer. It holds two 1,000-watt bulbs. It just sits right in the, in the connector points here. Um, when the first position bulb goes out, it breaks its contact, the complete cycle of electricity, and will actually ratchet around to the second position. And once it ratchets around, meets its contact, it's up and flashing again. The Coast Guard members keep a meticulous record of every nick and scratch on the surface of the priceless glass lens. At the entrance to the Savannah River's South Channel stands a unique little lighthouse with a big story to tell. The Cockspur Island Lighthouse, which stands just 25 feet tall, 
was designed in 1855 by architect John Norris, who is also credited with the design of the Customs House on Bay Street in downtown Savannah, and the opulent Andrew Lowe Mansion on Lafayette Square. The Cockspur Island Light is built on an oyster shell island, which is completely submerged at high tide. The drastic change is visible in this time-lapse video. The eastern side of the lighthouse's base is shaped like a ship's bow, which provides protection from the waves that crash against the brick tower when the tide is high. By all rights, the Cockspur Island Lighthouse shouldn't even be here. It was directly in the line of fire when Union artillery on the north end of Tybee Island opened fire on Confederate-held Fort Pulaski. The shells were flying over the, uh, the lighthouse going both, in both directions, and somehow it survived. It was not hit at all. But it's absolutely amazing that nothing hit that lighthouse during that very extensive bombardment. The Cockspur Light remained an active aid to navigation until 1909, when large vessels stopped using the South Channel. By the mid-1990s, the tower was in terrible shape. The National Park Service, which is responsible for the lighthouse and Fort Pulaski, carried out an extensive restoration campaign. They replaced the corroded iron lantern room with a new replica and repaired the crumbling brick walls. At a ceremony in 2007, the lantern was relit, but much work still remained to truly save the Cockspur Island light. In 2013, the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers carried out a project to shore up the lighthouse. Tons of rock were stacked around the base of the tower, and a concrete pathway was laid down so boaters and kayakers would have an easier time accessing the lighthouse. Now, a nonprofit friends group has been formed to ensure further work is done to stabilize the brick walls of this popular local icon. This little light has been begging for help for a long time. And it's been here 160, 170 years. So it speaks volumes about the history that's here. If it can only talk to us, it could tell us so much as to what's been going on all these years. And if you think about it, this little light has weathered storms and hurricanes and so on and so forth all these years waiting for somebody like John and I to put a group together to come say, we're going to save her. I just want it for my grandchildren to enjoy and the future to look at. I mean, it, there's a lot of history there. And uh, I'd hate to see it gone. Every time you come over the Lazaretta Bridge, I look out there and see it. And I'd hate to look out there and see nothing. It would, a uh, lot of history there. For now, the little lighthouse with the big group of friends remains on watch, a symbol of all the history that has transpired here since the lantern was first lit more than a century and a half ago. Off the South Carolina Low Country coast lies one small island that is home to two historic lighthouses. Dafusky Island, located between Savannah and Hilton Head, covers an area of just eight square miles and is accessible only by boat. On the island's north end, directly across Calabogie Sound from Hilton Head's harbor town, stands the Hague Point Lighthouse. It was built in the early 1870s atop the ruins of an old plantation mansion. Hague Point was a rear range light, meaning it was part of a pair of lights mariners used to navigate their way through the channel. Captains would adjust their course to line up the light atop the house with this smaller, shorter one in front. If the two lights were lined up, your course was true. Today, no one knows what became of the front range light, but the larger rear range light has taken on real meaning for island residents over the years. It is, I think, to everybody who lives on Defusky Island, this lighthouse is a very, very special place. Well, it's the hallmark of the community. It's been here since the 1870s, and so people just think of it as a part of the history and the culture and the heritage of the island. The Hague Point Lighthouse Tower rises directly up from the roof of the keeper's house. The lantern room is accessed not by a winding circular staircase, but rather by a series of ladders within the house. It's easy to see why this might have been a plum assignment for a lighthouse keeper and his family. 
you don't have to go outside in the elements to get to your job. And you can, all you do is go up the stairways and you're there and your family is here and, and things. It's just very, very easy to live, to be living in this house, I would think. Today, the lighthouse is the focal point of the Hague Point community, a gated private neighborhood. The lighthouse has been lovingly restored inside and out and is used as a guest house for people visiting the island. The Hague Point community also carried out an expensive but successful effort to shore up the surrounding waterfront, preventing the lighthouse from being lost to beach erosion. Dofusky's other, less famous lighthouse stands at a place called Bloody Point on the island's south end. In this case, the beachfront house was the front range light, and the rear range light was hung atop a 91-foot skeletal metallic tower like this one further inshore. It may not look like it, but this wooden Victorian home was a lighthouse. There was never a tower on top like at Hague Point. Rather, the light was positioned inside the dormer window upstairs. Now what you had is you had a fifth order Fresnel lens in there, which is in the smaller Fresnel lens. And it was on a brass rotating stand. So what they would do is they would line up the light from the front light in that dormer window to the back light. Now understand if they were off a little bit, because there was only one opening, they wouldn't be able to see the light. It would disappear on the front. So as soon as it disappeared, they would navigate back to get on it again. Beach erosion forced the lighthouse service to move the house more than 4,000 feet inland in 1899, and the light upstairs was removed. From that point forward, the structure served as the keeper's house for the Bloody Point range lights. Joe Yachis and his wife Mary purchased the house in 1999 and have restored it to its original white color and lovingly cared for it over the years. Yachis says he feels a powerful connection to the men and women who kept the light here more than a century ago. Being a lighthouse keeper is special. Living in a lighthouse is special. When, you, when you're blessed to be a lighthouse keeper, not too many people get a chance to do that. You feel it. From Bloody Point to Hague Point, Defusky Island's two small lighthouses have made a big impact on those lucky enough to be involved with preserving them for generations to come. Certainly through our lifetime and through many, many of our children and grandchildren, this lighthouse will still be standing. That's a very, very good feeling. Hilton Head Island boasts what may be one of the world's most recognizable lighthouses, the Harbor Town Lighthouse. This octagonal red and white striped tower was completed with private funds in early 1970 as part of developer Charles Frazier's Harbor Town development. It's the backdrop of the final hole on the world famous Harbor Town golf links and also attracts boaters on the intercoastal waterway. As Frazier intended, the lighthouse lends the surrounding yacht basin and its quaint shops and restaurants the air of a Mediterranean harbor village. I think Harbor Town is a wonderful, magical place where a family can come in in the morning and spend the entire day. Uh, you can climb the lighthouse, enjoy the beautiful view from top of the lighthouse. We offer the most beautiful sunsets anywhere on the island. The Harbor Town Lighthouse stands 90 feet tall. You may climb 114 stairs to reach the shop and observation platform on top. And at each of the nine landings, you can catch your breath as you enjoy exhibits about the history of Hilton Head, from the early archaeological finds through modern day sports stars. Well, it's actually very unique. Uh, the way we laid it out, um, as you climb, uh, you're going to experience an, um, some of the island's history. Uh, beginning from the early settlers um, uh, all through the Civil War, the gala culture, um, and as you get closer to the top of the lighthouse, you will um, see a landing where we designated a, a special spot uh, to celebrate the Heritage Golf. We get on the average of 200,000 visitors a year. That's a uh, lot of people. A lot of people. Out of um, those visitors, 25 to 30 percent are repeat, repeat climbers. These are families that come back every year because the kids can't wait to climb the lighthouse. There is another lighthouse on Hilton Head, this one much older but less recognizable. It's often referred to as the Leamington Light, in recognition of the plantation that used to be located here. 
This skeletal metallic tower stands 95 feet tall and served as the rear range light for a smaller, movable front light, which has long since vanished. The lights were part of a system designed to guide mariners into Port Royal Harbor. In the mid-1980s, this lighthouse was incorporated into the new Arthur Hills Golf Course at Palmetto Dunes Resort, where today it guides golfers to the 5th and 15th greens. The Hunting Island Lighthouse is like no other in South Carolina for more than one reason. It's special because it is the only historical lighthouse in South Carolina that is open to the public to be able to climb. From a distance, the Hunting Island Lighthouse may look just like its cousins up and down the southeastern Atlantic seaboard. But get up close, and you'll see the difference right at the base. Big exposed nuts and bolts reveal this tower's secret. It's made out of metal, and it's meant to be moved. It's actually of a cast iron panels that are welded together. Uh, it is one of uh, two lighthouses that's, that's known to be able to be moved. Uh, this one, Cape Canaveral Lighthouse, can actually be taken apart and erected in another location in the event, like say, erosion comes up to it. Unlike some lighthouses, which served as beacons welcoming mariners into ports and harbors, the Hunting Island Lighthouse was placed here to keep ships away. This lighthouse was designed to warn people of the shoals that are around here. We have huge sandbars and sand shoals that's coming off the St. Helena Sound, and uh, so it gets really shallow out there really quick, and uh, so it's best that mariners and the ships uh, back in the late 1800s there needed to stay away from this area. When a hurricane blew through here in August of 1893, one ship was unable to escape the deadly shoals. The steamship SS City of Savannah wrecked offshore, and survivors swam through the pounding surf to the lighthouse, where they took shelter until help arrived. Now approximately 100,000 people come here each year to climb the 167 metal steps to the observation deck, where they enjoy a great view of the beach and the surrounding island. All right, this lighthouse is 132.6 feet high to the very top. Uh, the observation platform where folks can actually walk up to and uh, see the uh, aerial view is actually 108 feet off the ground. No one knows what happened to Hunting Island's second order Fresnel lens when the lighthouse was decommissioned in 1933. However, visitors can see the remains of the similar but larger first order Fresnel lens from Charleston's Morris Island Lighthouse when they walk into the entrance at the base of the Hunting Island Tower. Unfortunately, the keeper's house that once stood on this location was burned down accidentally decades ago. But visitors can step into two small historic outbuildings and learn about what life was like for the keepers and their families who kept the beacon burning on this lonely outpost on the South Carolina shore. Alone, leaning, and surrounded by pounding surf, the Morris Island Lighthouse stands sentinel even though the island itself is long gone. The 161-foot-tall brick tower was erected in 1876, patterned after the Bodie Island Lighthouse in the North Carolina Outer Banks. Even the color scheme was identical, alternating bands of black and white. Over the years, the black paint absorbed more sunlight and heat, causing it to fade and give the lighthouse the false appearance of red and white stripes. Originally, there were 15 support buildings surrounding the tower, including the keeper's house. But man-made changes in the area's tidal patterns ensured the ocean would eventually take all the surrounding land. All those structures, including the outhouse, either fell down on their own or were removed so they wouldn't fall into the sea. When it was built, it was uh, 2,000 feet inland, and with the construction of the Charleston Harbor Jetties in the uh, late 1800s, uh, it began an erosion process that now has the uh, lighthouse, as you can see, about a quarter mile offshore. In the early 1990s, a group of concerned local citizens bought the iconic lighthouse and set out to save it. That's beautiful. Calling themselves Save the Light, 
These history heroes made it their mission to ensure neglect would never doom Charleston's signature structure. I think it matters because we don't want to let something like this just fall over and, and lose that valuable part of our history. Charleston has always been a, a harbor city, and this lighthouse helped guide ships at Mariner's Inn for, for 130 years. I think to let this fall over and, and just disregard what it stood for in its history would have meant something about our heritage. And Charleston has such a super heritage, we just couldn't let that happen. Today, the Morris Island Lighthouse belongs to the state of South Carolina. But Save the Light has obtained millions of dollars to perform critical restoration on the tower. In 2007, the group addressed the main engineering challenge. Saltwater worms had eaten away the wooden pilings that held the lighthouse up. Now, steel pilings have replaced the former foundation, and the entire base is surrounded by a sand-filled metal wall known as a coffer dam. So the lighthouse, that, the foundation that the lighthouse sits on now, is actually stronger than the one that it originally sat on. So at this point, we've accomplished a, a very important thing. It's not going to fall over. Other challenges remain. The glass in the lantern room is long vanished, allowing rainwater to enter the tower and causing rust to eat away at the intricate iron stairs inside. These stairs go from platform to platform. You can see that they're bolted to each other with these rods and these nuts. Of course, the threads look in pretty bad condition right now, but the stairs are bolted and all assembled together, creating one rigid member from this platform to the upper platform. You can see the condition they're in. We know you can't back these off, so we hope we'll be able to sandblast them and paint them with a protective coating. Even though wire screens block the windows beneath the lantern room, birds still find their way inside the nest, making it all but impossible to keep the interior clean. Large cracks run along the entire length of the lighthouse interior, damage caused by the huge earthquake that struck Charleston in 1886. But the most obvious effect of the famous trembler is the permanent lean it gave the tower. We have a plumb bob we installed in 2007 that shows the degree of offset, the, the amount of lean the lighthouse is experiencing right now. Because that plumb bob is offset by the center by 33 inches, we've calculated it's one and a half degrees offset leaning to the northeast. Save the Light estimates the remaining work on the glass, iron, and masonry repair will cost close to two million dollars. But having come so far to save something so important, stopping short of the goal is not an option. Well, I guess it's the most beloved reminder of the fact that we are a maritime community. And that would be the first thing. And I think the second thing is that this lighthouse has been part of the fabric of this community since anyone can remember. And it's one of those things that it's a part of your life and you can take it for granted, but once, if it's ever lost, uh, the damage is irreparable. So preserving it is about maintaining a tie to our past that's very important. And South Carolina and Charleston in particular is very good at, at that. The historic Morris Island Lighthouse was switched off for the last time on the same day the new Charleston Lighthouse was switched on, June 15, 1962. This is the last lighthouse to be built in America. This odd-looking beacon stands 140 feet above the dunes and beach on Sullivan's Island. It's located more than five miles away on the northeastern side of the harbor entrance. And this lighthouse is truly one of a kind resembling an airport control tower more than a lighthouse. The traditional lighthouses are round. This one is in triangular shape. It is supposed to withstand a Category 5 hurricane. The walls are, has a steel skeletal frame and aluminum siding. There was a lot of controversies when it was built. When it was first built, it was painted bright orange and white. The town of Sullivan's Island requested that it be repainted black and white as a traditional lighthouse. The angular shape isn't the only thing that differentiates the Sullivan's Island Tower from other lighthouses. For one thing, there are no stairs for the keepers to climb. This one, you had an elevator. This is the only lighthouse in America that has an elevator. Unfortunately, the elevator stops 25 feet short of the lantern room, 
forcing the Coast Guard personnel who maintained the light to climb hand over hand on a ladder to reach the top. When the lighthouse was first activated, the bulbs in the lantern room cast a 28 million candle power beam miles out to sea, making the beacon among the brightest in the world. But eventually, locals successfully petitioned the Coast Guard to dim the light to a fraction of that strength. In 2008, the Coast Guard turned the lighthouse over to the National Park Service, which already managed the surrounding historic life-saving station. Lead-based paint and asbestos on the interior have prevented rangers from allowing visitors inside, but the agency is working on a long-term plan that may one day allow people to once again ride the elevator up Charleston's strange modern-day lighthouse. About 30 miles northeast of Charleston stands an unusual pair of brick towers. These are the old and new Cape Romaine lighthouses. The old Cape Romaine light, 65 feet tall, was erected here in 1827 to warn mariners of treacherous shoals several miles southeast of the beacon. However, this stubby little tower proved inadequate to the task, and, using slave labor, authorities constructed a new 150-foot-tall tower, putting it into use in 1858. Both towers were eventually abandoned, but thanks in large part to the efforts of local contractor and avocational historian Tommy Graham, they still stand tall today. Well, I visited this since I was old enough to remember, and um, I think when it really came home to me that something had to be done and if I didn't try to kickstart it, it might never happen, was in 1981. I brought my two oldest children who were young then. Everything was going down, down. The top was open, vandals had destroyed everything. And I realized that uh, when they were adults, the whole scene would have disappeared if somebody didn't do something. Graham obtained federal funding in the 1980s to replace missing glass in the lantern room of the new light and hopes to be able to restore the rusted metal stairwell inside as well. Between $100,000 and $200,000 are needed to do the stabilization of the big tower and hopefully put a new waterproof cap on the old tower and then the cost will be ongoing over the years. Lighthouse Island, where the two towers stand, is in the wilderness area of Cape Romaine National Wildlife Refuge, so no new docks will be built to facilitate visitorship to the towers or the surrounding ruins of the keeper's dwellings. But Graham is partnering with the folks at Cape Romaine National Wildlife Refuge to make sure these special towers retain their important place in local history. This lighthouse is iconic in my little community. It's um, what people think of when they think of Cape Romaine, McClellanville, and um, it's, it's something that binds us together and is important to all of us, and it's a significant link to the past and deserves better than it's gotten in most of the time since the light was discontinued. The lighthouses are testament, if you will, testament of people that came before us. So I see lighthouses as threads that binds today to our ancestors of years past, and they're very important. And to me, it's just something to be treasured and to be protected and to share what we know about our lights and share that with other people. Today, the folks at Cape Romaine National Wildlife Refuge organize periodic trips so people can see the two towers in person.